As you know, we've been doing two concurrent series. We've been doing the book of Ephesians, verse by verse, studying that. And we've also been going through the tracks that we have in our tracked rack, our book nook back there. I'm going to do neither of those things this week. We're going to suspend both of them and do a different message. No worries, though. I'm allowed to make those kinds of changes. I have a permit. Permit. See, this is one of the things about grace, is grace sets you free from the traditions of man. It sets you free from denominational structure. Did you know today is the fifth Sunday after Epiphany? Yeah. And today we should be reading from Isaiah 40, Psalm 147, and Mark 1. That's what we should be doing today in church. But we're not going to because we're free. I said I have a permit. I wasn't kidding. It's right here. It says permit. I can do whatever I want. Steve Yoke. That's Nada. Huh? Yoke. I saw that. There, it's from a TV show that I've never seen, but I saw a clip on the internet where some a sheriff stops a guy or a cop stops a guy and says, "What are you doing?" He says, "Don't worry, I have a permit." And he hands him a sheet of paper. <laughs> it's just a sheet of paper that says, "I can do whatever I want." <laughs> that made me LOL, literally laughed out loud. But that's what's great about grace and great about a, a small body of believers is we can talk about stuff that is relevant to things we're studying and things that we have questions about and we can do it now. And that's what I was thinking after our Thursday meeting this week and everything that we talked about. I thought, man, we need to go back and plow some of that ground some more to talk about the things we talked about on Thursday night and lay it more out in a, in a clear fashion. So that's what we're going to do this week. And we were talking about the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. Another way to say it is like it says in Galatians 2.7, the gospel of the circumcision versus the gospel of the uncircumcision. So what happens is you walk out of a place, you walk out of a church that only sees one gospel in the Bible, and you walk into the, a place that says, oh no, there's many different Gospels in the Bible. They're very clear to see. You start learning some of them about it. And then you're talking to one of your friends and they tell you, oh, just claim this verse, claim that verse, you know, claim Jeremiah 29, 11. Everything will go fine for you. And you hear a guy like me say, no, well, that's, that's not your doctrine. That's not your apostle talking, he's preaching a different gospel, and they have different promises, and those aren't yours, these are your promises. And now you sit there and go, <laughs> because it's a lot easier when it's, oh, it's just one thing all the way through the Bible, and it's all the same. Well, now you've got different things, and you've got to study things out, so it gets difficult. Let's read the verse here Galatians 2 7. You should have read my mind. I know I didn't say the verse. Turn to where I'm thinking. <laughs> Galatians 2.7. This is Paul talking. He says, But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Two different guys. Paul says, the gospel of the uncircumcision to me, gospel of the circumcision to Peter. Question, is that one gospel to two different audiences Or is that two Gospels to two different audiences? Hmm. You must be a heretic. Yes. Yeah. 
is that one gospel to two different audiences or two gospels to two different audiences? Kind of depends on who you ask, right? You can ask a lot of people and get opposite responses to those kinds of questions. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So it depends on who you ask. It also depends on what Bible you're reading. Do you know that? This verse is changed in a lot of the new Bible versions. The New Living Translation, that's pretty popular. The New Living Translation says it's one gospel to two different audiences. It says, when they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. See how that reads? One gospel, two different audiences. The English stand, Standard Version says the same thing. Gospel to, not gospel of, gospel to, gospel to. NIV does the same thing. Gospel to the uncircumcised, gospel to the uh, circumcised. The funniest one is the translation that's loved by the scholars. The New American Standard Bible. If you're in the know, you call it the NASB. New American. The NASB says the same thing, gospel to circumcised, gospel to uncircumcised. But in the footnotes, it tells you it should actually say of. So the NASB says gospel to, and it's got a little FN right there. It says look down at the footnote. Then you read the footnote, and it says literally of. So they say, it should say of, but we changed it to two. So there's only one gospel going to two different audiences. So you've got to be careful with that. You ask, I say you get different answers depending on who you ask. If you ask me, I've got two different gospels to two different audiences in that verse. And that's what we're going to talk about today. One of the ways you know that is they're called different things. One of them says gospel of the uncircumcision. The other is the gospel of the uncircumcision. So they're called different things. And one of the things that we talked about on Thursday is another name for this is the gospel of the kingdom. And Paul calls his gospel what? Gospel of the grace of God. It's all the same though. Not so much. We're going to study that out today. Here's why. When you under, what's the most annoying question a child can ask you? Why? why? <laughs> Why? Why is that? <laughs> because you have to explain to them the facts and explain to them the reasons and the things around it. And then you get to the why. And it takes a long time. It's a lot quicker to say, because I said so. But isn't that our issue when we come to study the Bible? With understanding the key to understanding the Bible now is we, we've collected all the what's. We need to learn the what's and put the what's where they go. But what does that do? Now it answers our why question. Why did these guys get those promises and I don't? Why do I have this situation in God, in Christ, and they didn't? Why? So that's the point of understanding all the what's, is then it moves us into the next phase of understanding the why's. Because it's real easy for me to just stand up here and say, oh, no, that's not for you. That's for somebody else. What's your first question? Why? Why? <laughs> yeah. Because I said so. That's not good enough, right? <laughs> because I said so is not good enough. So, why is this my doctrine? Why isn't that my doctrine? These are the things that we're going to look into today. So, the gospel 
of the kingdom is a different gospel than the gospel of the grace of God. Turn, if you would, please, over to Mark 1. Mark 1, 14. So we, here we are smack dab in the Old Testament. We know that on the authority of the book of Hebrews. You can't have a New Testament without the death of the testator. So Mark 1, 14 says, Now that after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Did you ever notice that Christ's Jewish audience never asked the question, What kingdom? They never asked that question, did they? Just like when John the Baptist came baptizing and said, Hey, I'm out here baptizing. None of them said, What's baptism? They knew what it was. Baptism is under the law. Diverse washings. Lots of different baptisms. They knew what baptism was. They said, Why are you baptizing? That's the question. Why? Why are you baptizing, John? But Jesus talks about this kingdom, and none of them says, What kingdom? Because they know. They have a prophesied kingdom that goes all the way back into their, well, farther back into their Old Testament. In 2 Samuel 7, um, it's promised to David, When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And it goes on, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And farther down it goes, And thine house and thine kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. They are looking forward to their promises that go all the way back to Abraham. All the nations of the earth be blessed through Israel. Israel is the kingdom that rules the earth. In Jeremiah, it's another promise in Jeremiah 23. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute just judgment and justice in the earth. What would our planet look like with one day of justice, justice and judgment in the earth? Wow. But that's what they're looking for. They're not looking to die and go to heaven. They're looking for a kingdom on the planet, on the earth. Everything is made right. Justice, judgment. Finally, things are right in this place. That's what they're looking for. And that's what they're preaching in the beginning of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This kingdom is at hand. It's close. So they're looking for a literal physical Jewish controlled kingdom. And it's on the planet. Not only the kingdom, there's going to be a king. The physical person, the king, on the new capital of planet Earth, Jerusalem. Wow. John the Baptist, that's circumcision, right? If all the nations are being blessed through Israel and the Jewish nation is the capital of the planet, executing justice and judgment all around the Earth, that's uniquely circumcision. What do you do then with there's no such thing as Jew or Greek in the body of Christ if you try to make it all the same? Jesus told them about 12 thrones, 12 gates going into the kingdom. That's Jewish, 12 tribes. But John the Baptist, remember when John the Baptist's dad finally got to speak again and he spoke with the, the utterance that the Holy Ghost gave him? He said, Blessed be, this is in Luke 1:68. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, the circumcision, 
and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Hey, that's what Samuel was talking about. As he spake by the mouth of all his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from all the hand of them that hate us. Peace. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham. Prophecy promised. Now contrast that. Literal physical kingdom on earth, promised, prophesied. Contrast that peace being saved from their enemies and from the hand of them that hate us. Contrast that with what Paul says about the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20. What was that? Oh. oh. Acts 20. And uh, all the way down to verse 22. Acts 20, 22. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing what things shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying, The bonds and afflictions abide me. He's, Paul's not getting saved from nothing. <laughs> bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's Paul and his gospel. Gospel of the grace of God. Gospel of the kingdom. Gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom is at hand. That's what John the Baptist said. Matthew 3, 1. And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Everything that's been prophesied, everything that all the prophets have been talking about, it's here, it's happening. Repent. That's the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the grace of God is called the unsearchable riches of Christ. Meaning it's not was not prophesied. It was kept secret. It was, as Romans 16.25 says, a mystery. Is that different? Spoken about, not spoken about. That's different. So the kingdom gospel says the kingdom is at hand. The gospel of the grace of God. Are we looking for a literal physical kingdom on planet earth to go live in Israel? Is that what we're promised? The gospel of the grace of God says you're now. It's not at hand. If you've trusted Christ's payment for your sins, if you trusted his death, burial, and resurrection for your sins, you're saved and in God's kingdom now. Not at hand, kingdom now. I understand. I tell you, you're in God's kingdom now, and you look out the window and say, Nope. I'm in Ohio in the winter. It's, yes, it is judicial. Yes, it is a spiritual fact. But you're yet and still in your body. You have a job, if you're saved today, you have a job here to do as a member of Christ's body until you're done, and then you'll take your guaranteed position in heavenly places. But the fact is, you're saved now. Colossians 1.12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, it's fitting, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Already done. If you're saved. You've been delivered from the power of darkness and hath, another past tense word, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You're there. It's not at hand. You're not waiting for something to come out of the sky on planet earth. You're there now. Verse 14 in Colossians 1 says, in whom we have 
redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Is that different? Kingdom now versus kingdom soon or kingdom nearby. Remember, we're dealing with, it's all the same. It's just one gospel to two different audiences. Not so. On our Thursday night meeting, we looked at Israel's promises. Jeremiah 31, 31, 31 squared. Ezekiel 36, 26. Israel's kingdom... Let's ask a really tough question of the young ones up here. Who is Israel's kingdom promised to? Let me ask it another way. Who is Israel's kingdom promised to? Israel. Yes! <laughs> ding, 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 ding! The kingdom is promised to Israel. Gospel of the kingdom. Isn't that what John the Baptist's daddy said? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Who's that? Israel. And hath raised up an horn of salvation for us, Israel, in the house of his servant David, king of Israel. Israel's kingdom is promised to Israel. That is a huge thing to understand if you want to understand your Bible. Because if you make the church a replacement for Israel or a substitute for Israel, and we get all Israel's promises but not their curses, it's going to make the Bible a confusing mess for you. But if you can come to your Bible and say, no, God promised it to Israel, I think God's going to give it to Israel. That clears up a lot of problems. What do we know about the gospel of the grace of God? Who's, what's God's will in 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4? 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. God's will is for how many people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Few? Several? Hundred? No. God's will is for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. To Israel, to all, without distinction. Are those things different? First Timothy 1.15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe to him to life everlasting. That verse makes it impossible for these two Gospels to be the same. Gospel of the circumcision, Gospel of the uncircumcision. Do you know why? Little words. 1 Timothy 1.16 Paul says, me first. That's not difficult English, is it? Well, did Paul get his gospel before Peter got his? No. Peter and the boys have been preaching that gospel since all the way back when Jesus was alive, right? Paul comes along and says, I'm the me first pattern. That means it's impossible for these two things to be the same. Or Paul's a liar. Because if they're the same, Paul's not the me first. Those are your options. The gospel of the kingdom, we talked about it, a literal, physical kingdom to come down here on earth. How do I know that? Nobody's ever said the Lord's Prayer, have they? Nobody's ever heard of that? 
It's all your first time? Well, just so you know, in the, what's commonly called the Lord's Prayer, Christ teaches them in Matthew 6 to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the gospel of the kingdom, you're not praying to go up. You're praying for God, bring that kingdom down. Let's see some justice and judgment in the earth. Their gospel is about things being set right on the earth. Is that the same as the gospel of the grace of God? The gospel of the grace of God... Look over at Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse uh, 5. Ephesians 2.5, we're not praying for God's kingdom to come down here on earth. We're praying for us to go up into God's kingdom. Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up, up, up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That's up. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ. Where's that? Up. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. I know I ask the question over and over again, and it gets repetitive, but how can that be the same? Well, I preach a gospel where we pray for the kingdom to come down to earth. But it's all the same, so I preach another gospel that's the same, that we pray that we all go up to the kingdom. What? Which way are you going? I'm a yo-yo. It doesn't make sense. These things need to be rightly divided. It's right to divide them. It would be wrong to combine them if they're not the same. Next thing on the list. We already talked about it a little bit. The gospel of the kingdom, was it a secret? No, that's not what John the Baptist daddy said. He said, prophesied since the world began. By, all, by the mouth of all his holy prophets. Same thing Peter says in his sermon in Acts 2 of Pentecost. Or Acts 3, rather is when Peter preached it. He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Uh, verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Peter says, I'm not giving you anything new. We've been hearing about this stuff since Samuel from today. That's what Peter says in, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to Israel. You should all know about this. Why did he pick Samuel? We just read the verse. In Samuel, the prophecy to David about the kingdom that's going to be established forever. The gospel of the grace of God says prophesied since the world began. Or gospel of the kingdom. Gospel of the grace of God. Secret since the world began. We all know that, I hope. But remember where we started. Oh, it's the gospel of the circumcision, gospel of the uncircumcision. It's the same thing to two different groups of people. Not so. You can't make that square peg fit in that round hole. Everybody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. Those things are different. What about... By the way, I answer another why question. 
why was it kept secret? That's over in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul says, I, he shows up at Corinth, I don't want to know anything about you except Christ and Him crucified. In verse, uh, verse 8 gives you the answer to the why question. Why did he keep this a secret, what he was going to do with the, with the power of the cross? It says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He had to keep it secret. Satan thinks he's won. I got God's nation to kill their own Messiah. I win! Not so, Satan. I had a secret. You fell right into my battle plan, oh wise Lucifer. Who's the loser now, wise Lucifer? That's what Corinthians talks about. God made a show of him openly, triumphing over him in it. You think you won? Ha ha, fooled you. I'm God smarter than you. I made a joke about it one time. There's a football game today, I hear. It's as if God spiked the ball in the end zone in front of Satan. I win. He thinks he's had his best day, and he just helped orchestrate his own doom and ultimate failure. God is the greatest battle tactician. Anyways, I'm getting off track here. <laughs> um, the gospel of the kingdom, guess what I can do with the gospel of the kingdom? I can preach, and this probably goes to what you were saying about how I watched the guy on TV and he got so close and he got so close, but he didn't say it. I can preach the gospel of the kingdom all day, every day, and not tell you one thing about Calvary's cross. Do you know that? Not a thing. How do I know that? Such a great theologian. I read verses. Matthew 10, Jesus sends his guys out and says, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the same thing we're talking about, gospel of the kingdom. So they go out, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they're doing miracles, they're raising the dead, they're casting out devils, they're doing all this stuff, preaching the gospel of the kingdom all day, every day. Guess what they never heard about? Didn't know a thing about the cross while they're out there preaching the gospel of the kingdom. How do I know that? Again, that amazing ability. In Matthew 16... That's six chapters after Matthew 10, where they start preaching the gospel of the kingdom, is the very first time they ever hear anything about a cross. And Peter says, wow, can't believe that. I don't want that to happen. Is that the same? Just the same message to two different audiences? That's a pretty big deal. One has Calvary. One doesn't. That's a big difference. It says in Matthew 16, 21 is the verse. From that time forth, Jesus began to show his disciples. He had not yet shown them anything about it, and they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Do I need to tell anyone in here that the gospel of the grace of God, the cross is a pretty necessary thing, right? Let's just put it on the board. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You have no gospel. Paul has no gospel without the cross. His gospel is the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I declare unto you the gospel. What's the next thing out of his mouth? The cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection. That's my gospel. That's how you are saved. These guys didn't know anything about it. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I said death, burial, and resurrection. If you don't need the cross 
for your gospel, obviously you don't need the come back to life part, right? No resurrection. No resurrection to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Remember when they found the empty tomb? And the lady said, They've stolen his dead body! These guys have been preaching the gospel of the kingdom since all the way back at the beginning. Nothing about a cross. Nothing about coming back to life. And they go and they, see, they hear the story from the women. And in John 20, they go into the tomb. They look into the tomb and they believed. Did they believe the resurrection? No. They believed somebody stole the dead body. You don't need a resurrection. You don't need a cross to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Anybody know? 1 Corinthians 15. There are verses in the chapter after verse 4. If you read on, read on. There are. I got to the save part. I'm done. Woohoo! Verse 14 in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Well, 13. What's it say? Does it say the resurrection is necessary for the gospel, the grace of God? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. The gospel, the grace of God, if I don't have a resurrection, I'm wasting my time. Those things are different. On that note, the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection. You're out there preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You're out there preaching a literal, physical kingdom on earth with a physical king. And that's your gospel. That's your good news. It's at hand. The king, the kingdom are at hand. We're going to have justice and judgment in the earth. It's going to be awesome. What's about the worst thing you could do in response to that? going to have a king. He's going to rule from David's throne in Israel. We're going to have justice, judgment in the earth. The kingdom is at hand. What's the worst possible thing you could do? Kill the king. It's here. He's here. All the stuff that we've been waiting for by all the prophets all since the world began. What do you think? I think I want to kill him. That's pretty awful, right? The worst possible thing you could do in response to the kingdom gospel is to kill the man who is to be king. I mentioned Peter. Peter says that very thing when he's preaching in Acts 2. People say, oh, Peter preached the same gospel as, as Paul did. Look over in Acts 2. He's talking about the cross. Not in a good way. <laughs> Peter says in Acts 2.22, Ye men of... Oh, there it is again. Israel. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Yeah, remember that guy? The miracle worker? Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye, that's all y'all. That's the literal translation for ye, all y'all. All y'all men of Israel, where did I, where's my spot? <laughs> Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You wicked, awful people, you killed the king. Doesn't get much worse than that. Israel, we have a problem. What's that? You've killed your king. 
Huh? Then Peter goes on, But ha ha, God fooled you, whom God hath raised up, you can't keep him dead, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. <coughs> we killed our king, but God brought him back to life? Uh-oh. I killed the king. What, what do kings do for crimes? They bring the criminal before the king, and the king executes a sentence, right? I literally killed the king who's going to do the judgment. How's that going to work out for me? That's why the next question out of their mouth is, what do we do? We're toast. But then Peter says, no. Same thing we've been talking about since John the Baptist. Repent, be baptized. That comes from the Lord's Prayer on the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. So, the cross is awful in the kingdom gospel setting. You killed the king. What does, you remember what they, when Christ had disguised himself and he's talking to his men along the road? And he said, What's, why are you guys so sad? What's wrong with you? It's in Luke 24. Their response was, you know, don't you know what's going on? They killed Jesus. We thought he was going to be the guy that was going to redeem Israel. But now he's dead, so we know he's not the guy. The gospel of the grace of God, is the cross a bad thing? With the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God? Why are we singing songs about a horrible thing? Because by the revelation of the mystery, we understand what God accomplished through that cross. And the cross on the gospel, the grace of God, is glorious. Galatians 6.14, Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory. God forbid I glory in anything. Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing I have to glory in is the cross. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. It's all we've got. The gospel of the grace of God is that cross. Without his resurrection it's vain. What he accomplished there is glorious. It was kept a secret. That's what saves us and allows us to go to the kingdom up. And we preach it to all people that we're in the kingdom now. We're spiritually, judicially saved, sealed, seated in heavenly places. You can be too. Be rescued out of this awful place. Is that different? It's different. Why doesn't everybody know this? I didn't for most of my life. We need to tell more people, huh? Galatians 2.20, Paul's saying, I am crucified with Christ. That was a bad thing before. Now he's saying that's great. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. One more thing, and we'll be done. I promise. The gospel of the kingdom, I'm doing good. We're good. Nobody's going to turn into a pumpkin. Still under my allotted time. I've run out of room on the board. At least over here. The gospel of the kingdom, they're looking for their salvation in the future. Remember what Jesus said, him that endureth to the end? Peter, in 1 Peter 1.5, let's look at this verse. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5. 
Again, they're waiting for their inheritance in heaven to come down. Verse 4. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation now. Salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, that's the same thing he said at Pentecost. Repent, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When? When this future thing happens. When the times of refreshing shall come from the Lord. He's still saying it in 1 Peter. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. When? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith. What's the end? Salvation. The salvation of your souls. And then he says, this is not a new thing. This is not a secret. This is not the mystery of Christ. This is not Pauline. How do I know that? Verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. Prophesied grace to Israel, salvation in the future, when they endure to the end and get in their kingdom. Gospel of the grace of God. I got saved. Anybody ever make that statement? On that day I heard the gospel, I got saved. That's salvation now, right? It's not, one day if I make it, I'll get it then. You're saying, I got saved. It's a done deal. Ephesians 1.13 In whom also ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You hear the gospel, you believe it, you trust it, sealed, done. That's different. Those are different things, different situations. Anybody ever read Romans 5.1? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have it now. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory to come. We have it now. Those are, yeah, big differences. Think about those differences the next time somebody comes along and says, oh, Galatians 2.7, that's just one message, two different audiences, nothing to see here, move along. Some of them are different. Yes, some of them are mutually exclusive, opposites. A lot of things aren't the same. But the verse is right in Galatians. The verse is right where it says, not the gospel to the circumcision. Not one message to the, the same thing, to the circumcision, to the other. It says, no, the gospel of the circumcision. The gospel of the uncircumcision. Those are two vastly different things. So that is all I have for today. Like I said, coming from out of our Thursday meeting and all this stuff we talked about and bouncing around, and I thought it would be good to let's just stand back. We talked about a bunch of trees, a tree here, a tree there. A tree. Let's stand back and look at the forest. And that's what the point of this was today, to see the differences between these two Gospels. That is all I have to say about that, as the great theologian Forrest Gump once said. That's all I have to say about that. Oh, okay. Uh, anybody have any thoughts or questions? Yeah.